Yeah, so the ICA is a contemporary art institution. We are non-collecting. We are on the campus of VCU's uh, Monroe Park campus at the corner of Broad and Belvedere, which happens to be one of the busiest intersections in Richmond. Um, we um, follow an exhibition cycle similar to um, um, a school uh, schedule. So we have fall exhibitions and spring exhibitions and summer exhibitions. Uh, one thing that we really focus on here at the ICR are commissions. So um, thinking about starting projects with artists from the beginning, um, the very beginning of their idea, thinking about how our resources and our proximity to VCU as well as um, very uh, a large group of talented community members could help bring projects to life. So uh, ICA is a unique place for several reasons. Um, uh, it allows us to bring contemporary art to Richmond um, in a way that is um, uh, based in research, it's based in inquiry, um, it allows us to be open and experimental and to respond specifically to the needs of either um, a larger art world or the community, um, us not having a collection um, allows us that freedom and us uh, thinking about commissions as our primary work really um, 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 provides us with an opportunity to take on um, issues and or um, uh, circumstances that are um, immediately important to people. So we have, unlike large institutions um, that have slower reaction times, we are freed up from those kinds of um, um, limitations. The ICA is also unique um, um, because we really focus on um, um, engagement with individuals through um, discursive programming, uh, through our film programming um, that allows um, community members or anyone who would like to visit the ICA to be in conversation with the us, with the artwork, um, with the curators um, in real time, um, which I think is a really great asset to the community. We also oftentimes have artworks off-site, which extend um, kind of our footprint and allow artworks to go out in communities um, um, where need be, and our opening show did that. Um, and I engaged with um, 15 uh, barbershops and salons in Richmond to extend a part of an exhibition in those spaces. In the end, it was 10 salons that participated. Um, um, which was a really important way of stretching um, the, the uh, visibility of the work um, and um, allowing maybe people that feel intimidated to come here uh, to have access to work um, in, in, in the places where they go. Oh, wow. And what was the opening show? The opening show was Declaration, um, and the barbershop project was by Amos Paul Kennedy Jr., who is a, um, a printmaker from Detroit. So we have four galleries on our three floors, um, and sometimes we um, use the galleries differently. So um, sometimes we just use our first floor gallery, which is our biggest gallery, the Beverly Reynolds Gallery, as a site for exhibitions, um, um, solo exhibitions, group exhibitions, or traveling shows. Uh, these galleries upstairs, galleries two and three, which are um, uh, make a fork in um, on our second floor. Uh, we started developing that as a, a series called Dialogues. Um, so a series in which two artists had individual solo shows, but those solo shows and artist practice had something to say to one another. So that was a series. And then upstairs is our uh, provocation, the site for our provocation series, which is a large um, scale, longer term, um, 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 commission space uh, that right now is the home for Rashid Johnson. How was Grace, or how was the idea birthed? Who came up with it? Yeah. So Great Force really started um, from a place um, of inquiry about the histories that are so deep-seated in Virginia, specifically in Richmond. Um, histories following the Civil War, history following the Confederacy, um, and um, the reality of our demographic in Richmond, which is pretty split down the middle, black, white. Um, and so we were thinking about the ways in which those historical legacies and events um, were being carried forward um, in our public memory, in our built environment, in, um, and also through culture, through works of art, through writing, um, through critique. 
Um, so it started from that place, and it started, of course, you know, um, the research started at about 2016. Um, 2016, of course, was the time when we um, there was a new um, election um, um, uh, and presidential candidate. Um, in which um, the notion of divisive rhetoric, um, us and them, black and white, um, was really becoming a part of our public um, language and rhetoric. And so with the history and with our current um, um, situation, political, social, it became really important to, to, to think about um, uh, both the reality of division um, on a racial line and um, the reality of that, uh, both how it shapes our public imagination and how it shapes the way we think, uh, see each other and speak about um, um, each other and um, the places that we inhabit. I think in order to start a conversation about what will be most visible in the exhibition, through an exhibition that's really thinking about ways that um, people of color um, have both become visible and invisible based on racial constructs, I think it's important to start with the less visible aspects of the exhibition, and that is the um, thinking from these really important 19th century thinkers like James Baldwin where Great Force comes from his text, White Man's Guilt, and W.E.B. Du Bois, who thought about the color line as the problem of the, 21st, or the 20th century, um, uh, and uh, Frederick Douglass, who are all really important in thinking about where we are now. And so in this show, uh, there is um, a really concerted effort by the artists, which is one of the reasons why the artists came to be in this show, to think about the ways in which um, racialized trauma follows people, and particularly follows artists who produce work. And one of the things that was really distinct in a lot of, that is really distinct in a lot of the work and in our conversations um, at, through planning this exhibition was that there was an active turning away from images of uh, racial violence and subjugation. Uh, I think that oftentimes um, when artists of color um, are invited to produce work in institutions um, and more so are being invited to do so more so today, uh, with that follows a desire to teach um, the public um, um, about their experience through racial trauma. And that oftentimes reproduces images that are not necessarily um, helpful to continuing a conversation about what is really the complexity and the beauty that is black life and resilience in the United States. So throughout the exhibition, things like um, um, the prison industrial complex, things like black farming and cotton production, both by enslaved and then um, emancipated um, enslaved people are present. However, the images that those um, industries and events recall usually will not be apparent. So with the prison industrial complex, for instance, um, we have works by Sable Lee Smith, who uses um, the materials that separate both um, incarcerated and visitors, so prison visitation tables, which form a giant arch when you, that you walk through in gallery, in the, our first gallery, these big blue tables, um, and coloring books that are given to children to teach them how to navigate the court and the prison system, um, then become um, thought of through the sense of scale. So the um, um, reality of the prison industrial complex in the United States, which is represented through scale rather than through um, jumpsuits or through chains or through bars. Um, and for instance, works by Kevin Beasley, who is originally from Lynchburg, Virginia, um, brings in raw Virginia cotton as a material for sculpture. Um, his family has been um, 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 farming land in Virginia for centuries. Um, and his history is really deep um, when it comes to um, the reality of cotton production between the Upper South and the Deep South. Um, and uh, for his work, what you see is um, our sculptures that evoke the body and evoke labor and evoke beauty, but they don't evoke an image of the field worker um, and the overseer um, like one usually thinks of when they think about that history. And I would add one more thing. I would also um, really like to point out um, 
the ways in which we think about commissions and the way in which commissions can be used to reach um, people around us, people in our communities. And I think Tamashi Jackson's project, which is a, um, it's titled Monuments of Color, Red, Green, and Black, that is located on the facade of our building. It's an oil stick drawing on the facade of our building uh, that represents incredibly important American citizens, not only Richmond citizens, but American citizens. So people like Maggie Walker, the first woman um, and African American woman to charter a bank, um, uh, Spotswood Robinson III, um, really important lawyer and activist, Dorothy Height, um, Alicia Raisin, who was a community organizer in Richmond, um, who was in almost every single homicide um, scene in Richmond comforting families. Um, uh, Raymond Boone and um, John Mitchell Jr. are all represented on the window. And I think to honor people that have been fighting and championing causes in Richmond for a really long time on our facade is a way that we really can think about this kind of corrective, co commemorative um, justice um, that's really important to us. There is pretty much all materials that you can think of, mediums, right? So performance, you'll engage with performance the night of the opening. You'll engage with sculpture, painting, photography, uh, multimedia, video works, um, um, discursive works, participatory projects. So there will be um, a kind of a, a sensory overload, I think, when it comes to the ways in which these histories and these um, concepts come through in all different types of materials, all the way to the back of Gallery One, towards Paul Stephen Benjamin's Let Freedom Ring, which is a multi-channel um, piece on kind of analog um, 80s and 90s box monitors, um, on which each of them appears an image of Marian Anderson. And uh, Marian Anderson is really important, I think, to this exhibition for several reasons. One, because it's one of the few images that come through in the show, images of people, images of a body. Um, and it shows an image of a woman who in 1939 was really an icon to cultural defiant, to defying racialized um, um, discrimination through culture. So in 1939, um, she was meant to uh, perform in Washington, D.C. At, at the Constitutional Hall. Uh, and was barred from performing by the Daughters of the Revolution because it was segregated. Um, she was well known all over the world, in Europe, um, um, was welcomed in every venue. Um, and when she came back here, her home, her country, she wasn't allowed to play. And so um, people championed for her and she was then um, um, allowed to play, made, uh, given the opportunity to play, um, or we were given the opportunity uh, to hear her perform um, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, and she did so to um, about 75,000 people. Um, uh, and so her image is, is uh, overlapped with um, uh, images of symbols of America, like American flags, um, while she sings Let Freedom Ring um, um, from 1939. Um, so I think that's really important, thinking about that moment in history being so close to us in Washington, D.C., um, and thinking about the way in which our artistic excellence, despite how talented you are, is always um, um, uh, met with um, uh, biases that come from the color line, that come from the division between black and white. Um, so having that being the kind of uh, penultimate image that draws you through Gallery One is really important to me. Um, one of the things that we were really thinking about in this exhibition is the way in which this idea of force, great, the, in, in great force, can lead you towards works of art. So that work really draws you to the back to think about um, um, how far we've really come from now to 1939. Um, and that's a physical um, um, journey that visitors can experience. Um, uh, once you go through Sable Lee Smith's work, you are um, in a sort of corridor between uh, Carrie Mae Weems' um, um, photographs, colored pe untitled Colored People Grid, and Sable Elise Smith's coloring book drawings that really deal with the reality of race and how ch black and brown children have to deal with this reality at an age much younger than any other child which ha has to think about race. 
Um, so you have to go, you know, you go through that from adolescence to a conversation, for instance, by um, Troy Mishi in his work about um, uh, the over-sexualization of black and brown male bodies. Um, so there are a variety of things that you might see um, and draws that might tie you into different ways in which um, this history of division um, um, and racial discrimination affects various aspects of life and society. Great course. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and let, let everyone know out of your mouth um, the quote that it came from. So great force. Uh, comes from a quote by James Baldwin that was written in um, 1965 um, in an issue of Ebony Magazine, which was titled The Problem with White America. Um, and he wrote this piece called White Man's Guilt. Um, and in this piece, he talked about the great force of history as a um, um, force, um, of course, when we're reading Baldwin, um, it's about race, right? It's a force that follows us that he says we're subconsciously controlled by um, throughout history. Um, and uh, that's what I was thinking about, thinking about um, the ways in which we are still bound to those historical traumas um, over and over again, and the ways in which um, cultural thinkers, literary thinkers, um, um, community members and activists um, continue to uh, resist and continue to find strategies of empowerment um, against those biases. Um, so that was where this quote came from um, and is a, a real inspiration to the show. I think it's safe to say that maybe Baldwin is referenced in 50% of the works in the show. Yeah, we're wrapping up. Oh, I would say one more. Okay. Um, I would uh, also say that, um, you know, yes, Baldwin um, um, talked about this great force of history. Um, and in now in 2019, right, um, when we're thinking about a 400 year commemoration, when we're thinking about the reality of our um, political situation and the way in which greatness, um, American greatness, has been co opted to try and pull people back to a time in which um, white was dominant, this notion of making America great again, um, uh, which was a time in which not everyone was allowed to be an American. And so this, this notion of great um, and a great force, um, yes, Baldwin is the great force that tries to pull us out of um, 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 racialized um, ways of interacting with one another, but we're, we can't forget the reality of the great force that is thinking of pulling us back to a time um, where we don't need to be. <laughs> so I think that there is a tension there that's um, really important, and um, you know, language is really important in this show, and rhetoric, so um, um, that I think can't be ignored. So I would say that for us, for the ICA primarily, um, this is really important because one of the things that we are indebted to in the way that we program is this notion of research. And I think one thing that's really important when you're thinking about research is that a researcher is never satisfied, in a, or should not be satisfied, with the outcome, right, that they, that they um, have landed on. They should always want to take more, the new information that they learn, and continuously update. Um, this involves failure, this involves revision, um, um, and a co constant reassessment, yeah? And so we're attached to a major research institute, and so in thinking about that, and thinking about racial constructs and the history of those constructs were meant to keep people in their place, to be comfortable with being identified as white or black, or as Negro, as not. Um, and I think in a city where the conversation is so much about black and white, Confederate, non-Confederate, North and South, um, us being as part of a research institution, I think it's really important for us to think about both how we can honor history, but how we can think about history as a topic to be researched. 
as a topic to continuously be updated based on the information that we learn, based on the um, changes in our society, civically or academically or within the arts. Um, so I think that the kind of um, stuckness um, that racial constructs tries to keep people in, to bound people in, um, is one that the city is familiar with. You know, we can see it through um, uh, the way our neighborhoods are set up, the way the difference between the East End and the West End, um, the way that transportation works in the city. Um, uh, and I think that those are realities. Those are not realities that you can change as quickly as one can research or make work. But I think that having this be a place where we can attempt to um, reassess our historical trauma and make something new of it, um, I think that's really important to us and the artists in the show. Awesome. And my very last question is, what is your I would say, you know, we're welcome to all perspectives and people and anyone who wants to engage in a conversation. But I would say primarily those who wish to um, have a conversation or um, perhaps even produce something um, or engage with someone because they're unsatisfied with the way history um, has been written or the way history continues to be written, um, might find a draw within this show and within our program. So, program. so one of the things that we have um, to offer outside of just visual arts is programming and a place for conversation. So we have talks, like for instance, Claudia Rankin will be giving a talk, Rebecca Walker will be giving a talk. We have an incredible film series that's run by a colleague, um, Anjali Moon, in which conversations and um, um, become a tool to engage with people um, that have been placed within two sides of the barrier or the color line. And so anyone with interest in that, anyone in interest with the ways in which culture can do that, um, um, I think would find um, a place in the ICA and a place in our um, exhibition and programming. Um, in addition to Great Force, um, uh, we will be presenting a project in our Gallery 3, which is our Provocations Gallery, which is a site for our long-term commissions, or which currently sees a work by um, Rashid Johnson on November the 9th. Um, we will be opening a show by Guadalupe Maravilla, who is an artist um, originally from El Salvador that teaches in VCU Arts Department of Sculpture and Extended Media. He's producing a large-scale piece called Disease Thrower. Uh, he's thinking about his relationship as a, um, a child in the 80s who migrated to the United States across the border illegally um, for um, um, asylum um, um, in the United States. Uh, he's thinking about the reality that is um, going on at our border today, the conversation around our border and its proposed wall um, today, um, and creating a site for healing to, for those who have been traumatized, um, specifically undocumented or not, um, by those histories. Um, um, so that's a really important project for us um, that's following a, another type of um, societal division that um, we see, you know, it's um, impossible to talk about um, the history of slavery without thinking about the people that are literally in cages now um, at our border and in, in places in the United States. And so that project opens on November 9th uh, and that project will run till next summer. So uh, one of the ways that we're thinking about extending Great Force and the research that came out of Great Force um, and the contributions by the artists in the exhibition is through a catalog. We've produced a book 
um, with designers that are extending the um, graphic history of W.E.B. Du Bois's 1900 charts um, um, and infographics. Uh, that book uh, will be available um, for the public in November and will live beyond the run of the exhibition in January 2020. Um, so we hope that the research and the um, um, contributions will have a home um, in people's homes um, through this book um, that we've produced.